The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Quote, foreign governments are undoubtedly attempting to influence candidates and voters in Canada. So said Special Rapporteur David Johnston in his first report. Tonight we'll ask, what needs to be done to protect Canadian democracy from foreign interference? Then, portfolio manager and author John DeGoey explains why optimism bias might be bad for your finances. It's Monday, May 29th, and that's next on The Agenda. Nothing matters quite as acutely for our democracy as the integrity of our elections. For months now, Ottawa has been embroiled in controversy about foreign interference in the past and whatever is still ongoing. The government appointed former Governor General David Johnston as a special rapporteur to look into all of this, and he issued his first report last week. With us now, with their views on both that report and what's needed to move Canada forward, let's welcome, in our nation's capital, Richard Fadden, former director of CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, and former national security advisor to two prime ministers. He's now a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa. Akash Maharaj, ambassador at large for the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption and a senior fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the U of T. Susan Delacourt, national columnist for the Toronto Star. And in London, Ontario, Laura Stevenson, professor of political science at Western University and co-director of the Consortium on Electoral Democracy. And it's good of the four of you to join us here on TVO tonight. Let's just get a bit of background on the record before we begin our discussion. Here are some of the key takeaways from David Johnston's first report just out last week. He said there are serious problems with how intelligence is shared. For example, he said staff at the Prime Minister's office told him that they're given a large binder in a secure room to review material, but no ability to take notes because of security reasons. He accuses some media organizations of misconstruing intelligence. He says there is no intelligence confirming Chinese money reached specific candidates in 2019. He found little to support former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole's claim that specific candidates were defeated by foreign interference in 2021. And he says Liberal MP Han Dong did not, did not tell the consulate to extend the detention of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, something one media outlet did report. Mr. Fadden, to you first. David Johnson says his decision to recommend against a public inquiry into foreign interference was based on what he called unprecedented access to raw intelligence. Do we know what evidence Mr. Johnson based his recommendations on? Well, I think we don't know, and that's one of the complicating factors. Uh, I also think one of the complicating factors is that Mr. Johnston doesn't have any particular expertise in this area. You don't have to be a lifetime professional in national security, but he was given a very short time frame to look at material that's often very difficult to understand. Uh, first level intelligence in particular, it's not valueless, but it has to be put into context, it has to be analyzed and thought about. I have some difficulty believing in the time he had available with the resources he had that we should really take absolutely everything he says in his report as the final word on this matter. Uh, okay, let me do a quick follow-up with you. Uh, maybe no specific expertise in this area, but pretty smart guy in his 80s, has done a lot, a lot of varied things in his background. Uh, is it enough that he brings all of that to bear to this task? At one level, I think it is, but one of the, I've been arguing for some time now that we need a public inquiry. And one of the advantages of doing something in that way is that you have people on both sides of the argument making the case to the individual who's the commissioner. In this particular instance, Johnston was the only judge of absolutely everything without having heard both, both sides of the equation. Yes, he talked to people, but that's not quite the same as, for example, in the Rouleau Commission, having lawyers on both sides arguing the pros and cons of a particular point. The Rouleau Commission looked into the convoy issue, of course. Uh, Susan, let me get you in here. The issue of whether David Johnston was the right choice for this assignment, uh, given his longstanding I guess, past, let's just call it past association with the Prime Minister, 
uh, ha has had a lot of people debating whether or not there is value in these recommendations because of that relationship. What do you think uh, about the value of these recommendations given his past association with this prime minister? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the way this went ad hominem so quickly uh, that it, it really went to the bottom to to dismiss David Johnson as a ski buddy of the prime minister as uh, the opposition has, I think is probably uh, a little much even for, you know, a highly partisan environment. I think it's it was a bit much. That being said, I think we have to I do think it's important to listen to what Mr. Fadden is saying, too, is that um, that it can't just be his word. It's um, the whole business of asking for a public inquiry, the hue and cry for a, a public inquiry is to reassure the public. I was kind of surprised by how David Johnson, it, it was almost quaint, um, and I don't say that condescendingly, it, it, in the way that he believed Parliament could fix this. And if you've looked at Parliament lately, we know that um, that that may not be the best place for it. Hmm. Akash, what about that issue? Do, I mean, obviously, two different things to balance here. The experience, the integrity that David Johnston brings to the assignment compared with uh, what some would see as his being hamstrung uh, to go as far as might needs to go because of his association with the PM. Where do you come down on that? I think that his association with the prime minister can only reduce public confidence in his findings. And indeed, that was one of the purposes of this exercise. It was to reassure the public that if there have been issues, those issues are now in hand. There are clear connections between himself, between himself and Justin Trudeau. Uh, the Trudeau and Johnson families have vacationed together. He's a member of the Trudeau Foundation. He's described his grandchildren and Trudeau's children as being playmates. And Trudeau previously lauded him as a family friend. All of this is not to say that he's not a person of integrity, but it is to say that in a highly charged environment where already people are doubting the integrity of political actors, naming him to this role is not going to augment public confidence in the findings. Moreover, he cannot balance that against saying that he was uniquely qualified to play this role. There aren't any particular skills that he has beyond personal integrity and personal judgment that could not have been supplied by someone else who does not have those connections. I would say that there's one other aspect that has not really come into public debate, but which I also, I, I think, militates against this choice. And that is that he is a former Governor General of Canada. He is still chair of the Rideau Foundation, and he still bears the title, styles, honors, and president, uh, precedence of a former viceroy. The first, last, and ultimate rule of vice regal service is that you should not stray unnecessarily into public or political controversy. And I cannot think of a more controversial subject than this. Laura, do all of the things that Akash just mentioned render the recommendations that David Johnston has come forward with as being somewhat suspicious? I think they definitely raise people's eyebrows, let's put it that way, that when you're thinking about what has he put forward, he says there were no findings of this, there were no findings of this, there's no evidence of this, but a lot of people are thinking, well, what about another set of eyes? Now, he has recommended that two other groups, right, review all of the information he has and see what they think if they agree with his recommendations. So there's that. But this was always going to be a bit of a quandary, right? How do you find somebody with the background, I guess, or qualifications or expertise uh, to be able to do this position, um, to be able to carry out whether or not we make the help make the decision of whether we should have a public inquiry and the choice was made with somebody who i think maybe is respected but has a lot of uh question marks surrounding him okay richard fadden let me uh, sort of tap into your knowledge here if you need somebody who has unimpeachable integrity if you need somebody who has some experience in this field if you need somebody with no partisan connections whatsoever and clearly somebody who had no previous connections to the prime minister of the country who? I think off the top of my head, I'd probably go for either a judge or a former judge of the federal court who was sitting on the security bench. As you probably know, the chief justice designates a number of uh, federal court justices to deal with security issues. Uh, they have background after a while. They, they join that bench without having any. So perhaps a former judge uh, who was on the security bench of the federal court. 
And then, okay, Susan, I say to you, uh, the, the current chief justice would have been appointed by the current prime minister. You know, is it possible to find somebody who hasn't got some even tiny tentacle to this story mm -hmm. or to this government uh, who could perform the role that we need performed here? Well, I, I, I have a novel sort of idea, not just one person. I don't mm -hmm. think this mythical person exists. Um, I do think, though, mm -hmm. that a, a very good idea right now would be for Mr. Johnson to not preside over the hearings that he's promising, uh, that instead they be drawn maybe from a list of candidates compiled by parliamentarians, um, experts in the fields that he wants to look into, the diaspora communities, the, um, you know, the various aspects of our security infrastructure, get a whole bunch of people, get Mr. Fadden, uh, other people in Canada who are uh, experts to preside over a number of these things. And I think sort of stop this endless focus on one person and have it be a more multi, I'm thinking back, this is gonna date me, but uh, you'll remember Steve, when um, during the Charlottetown constitutional uh, cycle, that there were a series of hearings across the country headed up by by different people and different actors in the system, the, the whole one on Senate reform, for example. Now, Charlottetown may have not been a success in the end, but I, I do think the it would diffuse this situation a bit if Mr. Johnson wasn't doing all of it. Richard Fadden, if you were asked, would you do that? I probably would not do it because I think my views are too clearly, have been too clearly set out over the last several months and years. And I, I'd certainly be happy to testify and help, but I think actually sharing something like that, I would be uh, not taking my own advice about having people who have some distance. Akash, how about you? Do you like the, not, not you as an appointee to the commission, rather, but rather, uh, what do you think of the idea of David Johnston not being the chair of what goes forward and getting a, a different group of people in there at this stage of the game? Well, I won't take it amiss that all my fellow panelists <laughs> chortled when you said, how about you? <laughs> but I, I do like the idea of placing the next step in commission, that is to say, to have a variety of people involved with this. In the best of all possible worlds, we would have a, a group of commissioners who had been chosen from a short list put forward by parliamentarians. I don't know if that's possible. It's entirely likely, I would say, that at least some of the parties would not participate in that process because they would argue that it's a public, uh, a full public inquiry or nothing. But diffusing responsibility is ideal. I mean, ultimately, there is no contradiction between bringing in more people and having a, a, a better informed outcome. And indeed, having more people presents at least the possibility of perceived and real biases and differences of perspective averaging out. Ultimately, one of the findings that Johnson made in his first report is that part of the dysfunction in the security apparatus within Parliament is that there is a concentration of activity and a diffusion of responsibility. He could start by, uh, in, by remedying that in the way this commission or this next stage of the inquiry operates, that is to have a diffusion of activity and a focus of responsibility. Laura, let me get you to comment on what the clearly all of the country that is paying attention to this was interested in, and that was whether or not Mr. Johnston was going to recommend a public inquiry here. He has not. Uh, we've heard Richard Fadden already say that he still thinks a public inquiry would be a good idea. Um, do you think Mr. Johnston made the right call? As he said, concern for security and intelligence information going public, and therefore we're not going to have a public inquiry because of that. What do you think of that call? You know, it was really interesting as I was going through the report and, and thinking about this, right? Obviously, you know, doing what all the opposition parties were calling for uh, seems to be a sensible point to take. And then as I was reading it a little bit more, it was interesting. It struck me that perhaps, uh, in fact, what he was doing is prioritizing a public uh, sense of this, right? The, he makes a lot of in the report about making uh, an inquiry having to be in camera and not being to be able to be as transparent or as public as people may want. And I was thinking about this a little bit as why might that be so important? But I think as was already mentioned, right, whether or not the opposition's parties would actually uh, take part um, in some of these decisions, right? Even in choosing maybe a variety of people to, to lead uh, hearings, for example, could 
should be part of it, right? So the more that is public, the less that can be said is happening behind closed doors uh, or can be made of what might be happening behind closed doors that people might not know about. So I'm not sure it's the right choice, but I think it's the motivation behind it might actually be very much rooted in kind of what I guess Susan was pointing out, right? The instant attacks right away, the way that the different uh, parties seem to be coming at this from partisan angles. So there's importance of public transparency. Yeah, Susan, can I get you to comment on this, on this uh, particular angle of the story? That is to say, uh, the government has offered the opposition leaders complete access to the intelligence that's at the root of all of this. They'd be sworn in. Uh, and allowed to see this. Of course, they would not be allowed to talk about it afterwards. Um, most of the, I guess, the bloc leader and the official opposition leader have said, forget it, you're trying to suck us in, we're not going to do that. Uh, I gather the NDP leader is open to having that happen. Where do you come down on all of that? I, I was surprised by two things the day of the report. I was surprised by the fact that Mr. Johnson didn't hold a public inquiry, as Laura was referring to there. but. I was also really surprised, and maybe it's uh, my naive uh, optimism, I was surprised when the opposition leaders, the two opposition leaders turned down the chance to read what was in the, the documents and calling it a trap. And, uh, you know, as I said before, how low this went. I'm trying to imagine another G7 country where a legislator turns down a chance to read a top se secret national security report on a matter that has been before Parliament for the last few months. I, I I think that tells us where this debate is and where our politics are, but uh, I still was quite surprised. Um, the, the idea that they would be silenced by this, you know, uh, people have had some fun with it too, is, is are these opposition leaders never going to go into a cabinet meeting because they can't talk about it after? Or they never have a, a caucus meeting? This is, uh, pol all politics is not done in the open. Um, and I, I do confess to some surprise at that. Well, Richard Fadden, let's take them at their word when they said, how are we supposed to ask difficult, tough questions of the government if we have been sworn in and kind of taken into the government's confidence? We're sort of hamstrung to do that job if that happens. What do you think of that argument? I think it's overstating the, the constraints under which they're operating. Yes, they cannot refer to particular intelligence that they may have seen, but it will give them an indication as to whether or not broader questioning is going up the right path or not. Um, you know, I had access to a lot of highly classified information throughout my career, and I appeared before Parliament and uh, on a number of occasions. And what I tried to do was to aggregate up what I knew and still try and answer their questions. So I, I think they're overstating the constraints they operate under. I wonder if I could make another general point. I think this is illustrative of another much more serious problem Parliament has. Uh, Parliamentarians in Canada fundamentally have no access to classified information. You take MPs, they become ministers, and they're instant instantaneously expected to be experts in national security and highly secure material. Our British and Australian friends have found a way to give not total access, but much, much more access to Parliament. Uh, Mr. Trudeau's offer, I think, was genuine at one level, but probably was motivated to some extent by political expediency. But I think as part of this broad exercise, we should also give some thought to finding ways to give parliamentarians regular ongoing access to classified information. Not as much as the U.S. Congress, because they have a different system, but perhaps as much as the Britain and the Australians have. Laura, I gather they don't do that because they don't think that opposition backbenchers can keep a secret or that they're worried that loose lips will sink ships. Is that a reasonable concern? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know all the uh, nuances behind these decisions, but I, I think uh, the fact that we've had these leaks right now would suggest that some of the concerns might be somewhat founded. I mean, I'm with Susan. I was surprised that they didn't, uh, you know, take up the offer to be able to look at these documents. And it just speaks to this culture of not working together, I guess, like uh, just so highly partisan that it's, you know, this is a, a really big concern that we should be dealing with at the parliamentary level um, as a nation. And instead, what we're seeing is 
concerns about who gets to say what when. And I'm a little worried that we're going to be losing sight of the bigger picture because we're worried about leaks or worried about who's saying this or who's saying that rather than trying to actually, you know, work to protect the integrity of our democracy. Well, I'm going to take your advice and move on to the bigger picture here. And I guess, it, you know, the bigger picture here is not just this government, but Canadian governments in general, are they as attentive to matters of national security and protecting our democracy from foreign interference as they should be? Akash, you've been watching the national scene for a couple of decades. How does it look to you? They are absolutely not um, sufficiently attentive to these issues. One of the conclusions of Johnson's initial report was that information was being provided to the PMO and to Cabinet, but it wasn't being, being read because it was being provided in a format or in a way that political staffers and ministers themselves found to be difficult, impenetra impenetrable, or onerous. I don't think that that exonerates them in any way, shape, or form, because ultimately, this is their system. If the system was such that they did not feel they were able to get a grasp on what they were being told by the security, security services, it was their responsibilities to fix that and to fix it before it became a matter of controversy. Yes, there are black binders that are full of undifferentiated information. You have to do your homework if you're in high school. You should have to do your homework if you're in, if you're in cabinet. And if the nature of that information being relayed to you is, again, impenetrable, you have the power that is necessary to ask for that information in, a, in an alternative form. I think we also have to bear in mind that foreign interference in democratic elections is not the exception. It is the rule. Of about 200 countries in the international system, perhaps as few as 25 of them are full democracies. That means that the vast majority of, of countries in the international system are non-democratic and are hostile to democracies. It is in their interest, not just in China, but in every other totalitarian state, to make the case that democracies cannot succeed, democracies will always fail, and to project their power into democracies in an attempt to do that. We have to be, bear in mind, as one of the few democracies in the world, that we will always be beset by an ocean of enemies of democracy, and we have to take that seriously. I see no evidence that that is being taken seriously. Well, having said that, and Richard Fadden, I'll go to you on this, no known interference from China, says the report. You buying that? No, absolutely not. I think that's dead wrong. Can I back up a little bit and, and make uh, try and explain why I think this government and previous governments don't spend enough time on national security? Sure. We don't feel particularly threatened in Canada. We have three oceans and we have the United States. So as a country, we don't worry a lot about national security and we don't think a lot about it. During the course of the last two federal elections, the issue foreign defense and security policy did not come up once. I think that's wrong because there are real threats against Canada, both the terrorist side, foreign interference, foreign espionage is now worse than it was during the height of the Cold War. We don't have a national security culture like all of our allies do, and I don't quite know what to do about it except to expect our national leaders to talk about this more in a, in a reasonable manner. But until uh, they see votes in national security, with the exception of real crises, I think when there are real crises, we do respond fairly well as a country. But until there are votes in national security, politicians are going to pay more attention to economic or social policy. Added to this is the realization, I think, that every prime minister comes to office with a, with a particular area of interest. I think it's beyond reasonable debate that Mr. Trudeau is his social policy. Mr. Harper, I think you could probably argue, was economic policy. But having said that, we elect them to worry about all of our challenges, not just the ones they're particularly interested in. But there is, I think, an explanation in the fact that, broadly speaking, we don't feel threatened. And that has a real impact on the amount of time and effort that people are prepared to put into these sorts of things. But I really agree with the, my co-panelist's previous point. If ministers and prime ministers don't like what they're getting from the national security agencies, they only have to live, raise the smallest finger and they'll change what they're getting and how they're getting it. Hmm. Susan, you've seen more than a few governments come and go, and I'm curious as to whether or not you think this government is, is any more significantly lax than others as it relates to their interest in foreign interference on our democracy. No, I don't think so. I, I, you know, I like the other panelists, I haven't seen any evidence of, of previous governments being concerned about this. 
I think, you know, we're isolating this to, to maybe the issue of China interference because it's in the media and on the front pages. But when you think about it, uh, since the convoy, at least, we have been worried about the integrity of the system. Uh, we have been worried about uh, our democracy getting messed up by outside influence. I recall Fox News uh, in the United States trying to whip up uh, intimidation of elected officials around the convoy. So, you know, we it is a very uh, hostile environment right now to be a politician. I think all parties should be seized with this, not just from state actors, but from non-state actors, from internal uh, problems, et cetera. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. And I think we're venting it over the issue of China interference, which is serious, but we're not considering other countries and also the, the, the threats within, if that doesn't sound too melodramatic. <laughs> Akash, did I hear you trying to get in earlier? I was just going to take one point. You said that the report found that there was no interference from China. That's not exactly what it said. It said that there was no successful interference from China. In other words, Johnson did confirm that there were efforts or plans that were being contemplated by Chinese state actors to interfere in our elections, to pass funds to specific candidates, but he did not see any evidence that that had actually happened. What that means, in effect, is that to the extent to which there was no Chinese interference in our system, it was because the Chinese lost interest or, or their, their attention wandered. It was not because of any defensive or remedial actions by the intelligence services or by the government. In effect, to the extent to which there was no successful interference, it's because we got lucky, not because we were competent. I appreciate that clarification. And maybe I can uh, turn that over to Laura and ask if we... Maybe you could rate the state of how confident Canadians feel about the integrity of our elections right now. And, I mean, thankfully, we haven't had a situation like they had in the United States after their previous election, where you've got one major candidate coming out and saying the whole damn thing's rigged and we should throw out the results. But, but we may not have 100% confidence in where our elections are either. Have you got some ideas about how we might restore more faith among the electorate in the way we do these things? So an interesting point on that, Steve, is when I, so far, when I've been looking at the data, and of course it's not completely up to date, right? Um, we don't see huge dips in confidence in government institutions or in elections. And I think this actually goes to what uh, one of my co-panelists was talking about. So we don't feel threatened. And so when you don't think there's anything really, truly wrong, like you're not taking it seriously, then you just think, oh, everything's okay. And this is something that, uh, you know, I suspect we'll be moving a bit more. And if, you know, if we had data from, you know, right after the report came out and stuff like that, we might see some smaller blips, but we aren't seeing a ton of movement. And I think that for the most part, Canadians are is it maybe complacent is the, the term I'll use, right? That we're kind of comfortable with what's going on and we have confidence in our institutions. And, you know, I, I, just to raise one other little point, which is interesting, because when you think back to the 2016 American election and Elections Canada was really doing a lot to prepare us for 2019 and for 2021, and we were really worried about kind of the, the interferences we, we thought we'd saw it see through social media and other things. And then when we, you know, look at what's, actually being discussed in terms of interference, it's a lot more kind of, I'll call it old school, right? It's like funneling money through one person to do something for another person. It's a lot harder to track too, right? We have laws against uh, election finances if they're coming from, you know, um, non-Canadian persons. But what do you do when someone gives them the money to then give, right? And how do you track that? And how do you know what's even happening? So I think in some ways, I would love to hear more about what the public has to say and their own experiences with this to maybe give a better sense of how real this is. Sure. And Richard Fadden, I'm wondering if you see the possibility out there of intelligence services and local law enforcement uh, officials, services, working more effectively together to prevent foreign interference against, for example, our, our own candidates who are running for office. I think there is uh, there's a role there for police services and for intelligence services, but what I have not understood so far is where is the chief electoral officer who is principally charged as an officer of parliament to operate and to protect our electoral system? 
Uh, I think the f best thing that we can do in terms of dealing with foreign interference initially is to talk about it in a cool, calm, and collected way to make people more aware of what's going on. And then I think we have to decide how broadly we're going to try and deal with threats to our electoral system. Many people are now arguing that part of the issue is before the writ is dropped, when political parties start picking their candidates. I've argued uh, in a couple of occasions that we should try and, and, and find some way to deal with that issue. And a few political people that I know have sort of said, are you mad that you're going to the core democratic process? The last thing we need are a bunch of bureaucrats or spies mucking about in there. Mm -hmm. I understand that argument, but maybe there's a role there for the chief electoral officer or for legislation imposing upon political parties a duty of exercising some due diligence, you know, and relying on some sorts of information. So I think it's possible to reduce our risks. But this is not like, for example, terrorism. There's no smoking gun here. This is going to be a very difficult issue to deal with because proving it, there's no possibility of proving it to the level of, you know, the criminal law. So we're going to have to decide how much information about this sort of activity we're prepared to take uh, before we act. I think our general tendency in Canada is to try and be so fair when we accuse anybody of anything that if we apply it exclusively to this area, to the area of foreign espionage and foreign in interference, we're not going to make much progress. Hmm. Susan, what do you think of that idea, getting the chief electoral officer much more engaged on this file? Yeah, I too have been uh, wondering where that voice is in all of this, uh, and and where it has been. It's it's a, it's almost like we don't trust the institutions to deal with the problem we have before us. And Parliament is making it that case as well that it's it's not able to handling it. So do we have to invent something new? Do we have to mm. have maybe somebody uh, <laughs> more more bureaucracy? Do do we need another layer of um, of oversight at Elections Canada. I don't I don't have the answer to that, but it's um but I do think the more attention to this the better. Well, and David Johnston has certainly Akash uh, shone a light on this aspect in his report. Uh, he very much wants those affected uh, in diaspora communities who are the targets of foreign interference uh, to be to be better protected somehow. Any thoughts about how about how that might be done or even whether that can be done? It certainly can be done, but it can't be done as an afterthought. I saw no indication in his report that he actually spoke with diaspora communities or organizations representing them. Instead, that he simply added this on as a sort of codicil. To the extent that diaspora communities are an afterthought in the security apparatus, they will always be a vulnerable point. How can it be done? It can be done through constant dialogue. It can also be done through greater oversight of the party, of the party political system, of the nominations process. I would argue that it is precisely because the nominations process, the nominations of, can of candidates, is at the base of our democratic system that it deserves and demands higher levels of public scrutiny. Functionally, you cannot vote for a candidate unless that candidate has first been chosen by a party. And diaspora communities are especially vulnerable in being stampeded to the ballot box to vote for partic particular candidates, in part because that process is almost entirely unregulated, at least publicly unregulated. And it is no coincidence that the kind of interference that we have see had hints of from the Chinese government have been interference primarily with funding and choosing candidates. Because if they can control who the candidates are, they don't need to, to worry about interfering in the election itself. I would say, finally, that I think that there has to be a greater culture within the government of Canada that while you can delegate function, you cannot delegate accountability. There are all sorts of, of officials who are involved with public outreach and in oversight of the, of the intelligence services and in receiving reports. The government seems to think that because there are so many fingers in this pie, it holds less responsibility and less accountability. That's not the case. You can ask people to carry out functions for you, but you cannot ask them to carry accountability for you. It is your responsibility, and it is both unsustainable and vulgar to see some of the most powerful men and women in our country trying to excuse themselves with pleas of ignorance and impotence. Having said that, and I'm down to my last 20 seconds here, unfortunately, Susan, we've got one member of Parliament, Han Dong, we've got one member of the Ontario Legislature, Vincent Kerr, 
who've had terrible allegations made against them, and there's every indication that those allegations are false. What should happen to them now? I, I, I won't be surprised if Mr. Dong, I won't speak to, uh, to Mr. Ko in, uh, in Queen's Park, but I, I would not be surprised to see uh, Mr. Dong back in the Liberal caucus. Gotcha. I want to thank the four of you for coming onto our program tonight and shining a light on a really troubling issue, which uh, I think the four of you have articulately spoken to the need for more attention to. Richard Fadden, Susan Delacorte, Akash Maharaj, Laura Stevenson, thanks so much for coming onto TVO tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Financial markets went on quite a ride over the past few years. Did you grin and bear it because it'll work out over the long haul? Well, as much as that may indeed turn out to be the right approach, portfolio manager and author John DeGoey has some cautionary words for those inclined to see the glass as half full. He explains in his new book, it's called Bullshift, How Optimism Bias Threatens Your Finances. And John DeGoey joins us now. One does have to be careful how one says the title of you, your book. You think? I think, yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, first of all, welcome. Thank you Good so much. Good to see you again. Let's, uh, let's do an excerpt from the book and then we'll chat some, okay? Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this up. It goes without saying that people don't spend time worrying about things that they are oblivious to. This is a book about a problem that hides in plain sight, yet persists because so few people recognize it. For about a generation now, there has been a growing body of evidence that traditional economic assumptions and models are flawed. In these models, people are assumed to be sensible and self-aware. In fact, though, all of us are essentially misguided or biased. Many of our choices seem entirely reasonable, yet they often fail when put to the test in the real world. Despite this, many traditional economists act as though their demonstrably incorrect assumptions are reasonable. People who provide financial advice are similarly blinkered. Houston, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. What is the problem you see hiding in plain sight? People honestly think they're doing the right thing when they take a positive approach to investing. That's true for investors. That's true for the people who give investment advice to, to investors. And that works out 19 times out of 20. It's usually a very good way to look at things. But when you are optimistic to the point of denying realism, where you don't even think about what could possibly go wrong, there's a real risk that you're taking on more risk than you otherwise would or should, and that you could leave you exposed to real problems if markets tumble. Isn't being optimistic a better way to live? It sure is. In fact, a lot of the research shows that optimists, Danny Kahneman, who uh, won a Nobel Prize in 2002, said that if you could give any one thing to your kids, it would be to, to wish for optimism or joy, because it correlates positively. Optimis optimistic people live longer, they have happier marriages, they're more fulfilled in work. Any way you look at it, optimism is a good thing. And you're telling us not and, to be that. And I'm saying it is a good thing. Be optimistic. <laughs> Just be careful. Just don't overdo it, because too much of a good thing can be no good, too. There are a lot of biases out there, and yet you've chosen to focus on this one in particular. Mm -hmm. Why this one? So optimism bias is when you think things are not going to happen to you. So you're overly optimistic because you think, oh, other people will get divorced, but not me. Other people will be in a car crash and not me. And because it is the sort of thing that is generally thought of as being the good bias, it's the one that people sort of skate over. They don't think about it. They just sort of say, it's going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. And that's where the risk is because you don't contemplate what could go wrong. That's how you sort of think, oh, well, this isn't going to go wrong, so I'll be fine. And <laughs> that's when things go wrong. Do you want to define bullshit for us? Gosh, I'm being so careful the way I say the title of your book. Yeah, you've done a great job so far. Thank you. So, uh, I've talked about optimism bias already, so it, it, the, the book is about optimism bias, but Bullshift is a portmanteau that I've coined, which talks about how the financial services industry shifts your attention to being bullish. So it's a sort of like a jujitsu where you sort of look over here, look over here, and they always focus on the glass being half full as if that will get you through whatever it is that you need to get through, and usually it works but not always. Don't you want to, though, inc I mean, you're in the business of mm -hmm. sort of encouraging people to give you their money and mm -hmm. you invest it and things you hope turn out well. By writing a book like this, are you not in some respects arguing against your very own profession? So this is my point, is I don't want to argue against anything. I want, like any profession, law, medicine, accounting, you want to be as professional, as evidence-based, as client-centric as you possibly can. And my point is 19 times out of 20, optimism works out. The problem is, 
people who do what I do for a living are loath to talk about, what about that one time out of 20 when things might not? To hear financial advisors tell the story, it's always a great time to invest. There's never a time to be worried. Mm -hmm. And surely to goodness, it must happen sometime. <laughs> it, mind you, if my financial investor uh, advisor came to me and said, I can make you money 19 times out of 20, I would take that. Don't you think most people would? Sure. But if you could find a way, and, and I'm not suggesting you can make money 19 times out of 20, just to mm -hmm. be clear, but but over over long time horizons, I saw something on Twitter the other day that if you look, if you take 10-year chunks, 19 out of every 20 10-year chunks, the market is up over that time frame. Mm -hmm. So that's why I use that number. But there will be instances where you can go a full decade and not make any money. And if if it looks as though one of those instances might be on the horizon and you're risk averse, could you at least consider being doing something a little bit differently? I think mm. you might want to. You make a reference in this book to, and I hope I'm going to say this properly as well, because I've never heard of it before reading the book, the Semmelweis reflect? Mm -hmm. Reflex. Yeah. Is that right? Semmelweis? Semmelweis, yes. Reflex. What is that? So there's this guy named Ignaz Semmelweis, who in the mid-1800s was a, was a physician. He's from Hungary. He was practicing in, in Vienna. And what he found was that if you wash your hands, uh, if doctors wash their hands, they will do a much better job of, of mitigating the transmission of diseases. And it, it helped to reduce puerperal fever because the women at hospitals in Vienna were, were dying and, and having various infectious diseases at a 10 times greater rate than the people who, women who were giving birth with midwives. So there was obviously something wrong. So he figured out this is probably why it is. He did the research, did all the you know, empirical testing, brought it to his fellow physicians, and they pilloried him. They hated him for having the audacity to actually bring forward evidence that disproved their pre-existing worldview. And that's a real problem because people, professionals are supposed to be making decisions based on evidence. And it's true that a lot of people think they want to do what's right, and they say they want to do what's right, but when you actually get right down to it, when your identity is being challenged, when the doctors of the day in, in, in Semmelweis's time, they would say, I'm a gentleman. I, I can't be part of the problem. We, I've taken a Hippocratic oath. I'm here to be part of the solution. So they gave him a hard time for having the audacity to suggest they might be part of the problem. And that's sort of kind of what I'm dealing with as well. I was just going to follow up. So how is that relevant to what you see in financial services nowadays? So the financial services industry is like any other industry. It wants to do the right thing. The, the, the people who offer advice are almost universally positively inclined. They, they have good intentions. They do a good job. This is not to cast aspersions on intent. This is to say you still need to stop and think about despite your good intentions, are you doing things properly? And if you're not doing things properly or if you could do things differently, Shouldn't you reflect upon that and maybe try doing things a bit differently? We do remember the time. I mean, I think you and I are probably both old enough to remember. There was a commercial that used to run on television. Four out of five doctors mm -hmm. recommend you smoke this brand of yeah, cigarette yeah, for sure. if you're going to smoke cigarettes. Yeah, so, and, and, yeah, and we have banks saying you're richer than you think. There's a lot of optimism <laughs> that that's sort of embedded in the system that we don't even think of it. We just take it for granted and we assume that, oh, yeah, that's, that's good because we want to be optimistic. Do you think it's nefarious? I mean, we understand that it sort of plays upon our desire to be hopeful about the way things work. But do you think they have nefarious intent as they do it? So then it becomes a question of the extent to which they internalize the evidence. So if I say to you, so I'll give you an example here. Have you ever heard someone say, Steve, we're in a lottery number picker's market? No. No. <laughs> because no. it's ridiculous. It is. No one would say such it. a thing, right? No. But in my business, for 100 years, people have been saying, we're in a stock picker's market. And it's the same sort of bullshit. It's the sort of thing where you say it, because you want people to think it's true, but if you, if you stop and reflect upon it and you think about it logically, well, whenever a stock is traded, there's a buyer and there's a seller, and if one of them benefits, the other one suffers by an equal amount. Net-net, there's no gain. You're not doing any better. It's not like it's better to, to pick stocks on Thursday than it is on Friday. It's not like you know we're in a new moon, so now we can pick stocks. There's no such thing as a stock picker's market. But the industry says it because it's good for business, and people buy it because they want to believe that it's possible. Are people in your business giving you a hard time when you put this forward? Sometimes. People in my business have been giving me a hard time for a while because I've been trying to move the ball forward to make things more professional and more transparent and more evidence-based. But when the evidence makes people challenge their own self-identity, they don't always like to hear it. Mm. Okay, here's another term from the book. The Stockdale Paradox. What's that? Jim Collins, in his book Good to Great, talked about this. There was this Admiral uh, James Stockdale, who was the senior ranking officer in the Hanoi Hilton during the Vietnam War. 
And in Vietnam were, as you might imagine, all the GIs, they're, they're being tortured, they're being, all, all manner of things are being starved. And by the time the war ended, only a few hundred GIs got out. Thousands and thousands of others died in captivity. So the press naturally went running to Stockdale and said, so you made it out and the other guys didn't. Like what, what, what made you and the other guys that made it out, what's so special about you guys? And, and Stockdale says, well, that's easy. The guys who didn't make it out, they were the optimists. And mm. the press went, what, what are you talking about? Well, it turns out that the optimists were the ones who would say, well, we'll get out by Christmas or we'll get out by the 4th of July. Or we'll, you know. And they kept on setting arbitrary dates and then the dates would come, the dates would go, they wouldn't be out, and they would lose hope. So the Stockdale paradox is where you have to be able to have the stoicism to stick with whatever it is you want to accomplish, no matter what, come hell or high water, and then at the same time, deal with the brutal reality of what it is you're dealing with. And you can't sugarcoat the reality, but you can't let go of the, the objective either. Hmm. I seem to, uh, you tell me if I'm remembering this right, I, was he not Ross Perot's running he mate? He was Ross Perot's running mate, he when, was indeed. Yeah, when Ross ran for president. You draw the distinction in your book between classical economics and behavioral economics, and we've talked about both those things mm -hmm. on this program, but mm -hmm. maybe just help us out again. What's the key distinction between the two? Almost everyone who gives financial advice and who thinks who works in the financial services industry uses classical economics. And that is based on the idea of supply and demand, the things that you usually think about. People are rational, utility seeking, uh, utility maximizing optimizers, people who make good, smart decisions based on what's best for them because they're very good at synthesizing information and making a decision based on that synthesis. Behavioral economics, in contrast, has been the upstart. And if, if traditional economics made sense, then there would be no anomalies, there would be no exceptions. But in fact, what the, what the behavioralists are showing is that there are dozens of exceptions and they are predictable. They happen over, people are predictably irrational. They make the same mistakes all the time and those mistakes are usually rooted in self-interest and thinking too quickly and not really stopping and reflecting and just doing what seems right without actually stopping and saying, is that really the right thing to do? So when you think about how a lot of the evidence of, of, of economics is that what we think is going to be true, what we think is going to work doesn't necessarily work, maybe we should stop and reflect upon, well, what actually does work? And that means thinking more about um, uh, social psychology and the way we all want to fit in and the way we sort of want to keep up with the Joneses and the way we do things that because other people are doing them, there's FOMO, there's the fear of missing out, there's the Tina, there, there's no alternative. There's a whole bunch of different things that we do that are just part and parcel with the way we invest and the way we go about our lives that we don't give it a second thought and yet it's not rational. Uh, I, you quote Dan Ariely in the book. I do. Who's the leading guy, I guess, on this behavioral economics. You ever met him? Yes, I have. He's terrific, isn't he? He's fantastic. We've had him yeah. on this program a number of times. He's just great. Okay. You've told us the kind of role that you think financial advisors ought not to be playing. Mm -hmm. How should they be playing it? The first thing they need to do is they need to learn more about behavioral economics because financial advisors, if you ask them, will almost all say, what I do for a living is I'm a behavioral coach. Okay, that sounds good. I, I, I could use a behavioral coach. We could all, all do better if we had a coach. But a behavioral coach says, I'm going to help you to focus on the things that are going to be more purposeful in your life. So I'll help you to save more. I'll help you to take a long-term perspective. I'll make sure you know whether to put the money into your RSP or your TFSA, what have you. But the coaching that, that needs to be done and, and the things that need to be learned is advisors need to think about, okay, if I'm going to call myself a behavioral coach, what do, I know, what do I know about behavioral economics? Is this client of mine anchoring on a previous number because they had a portfolio that was worth more at some date? Are they guilty of recency bias because this worked out last time and therefore I'm just gonna do the same thing all over again? There are a number of biases that we're all prone to that if we're more familiar with what they are, we could do a better job of coaching our clients out of those problems. Do you attempt to get financial advisors to buy into this different way of looking at things? That's a big part of what the book is about, yes. How well is it working? So far, not so well. But that's the problem that I talked about with Semmelweis, right? People don't, if, the, if you think you've got something down, whatever it is that you do for a living, the last thing you need is someone coming along and saying, you're doing it wrong, or I'm not necessarily saying you're doing it wrong, but you can do it better, you can do it differently. Here's another way of looking at things. People are gonna say, yeah, but I got it down. Why, why, why do I need to do it differently? I'm doing it fine. Because you make the case as it is. You, yeah. you, you, so, you make a good case in the yeah. book that people are doing it wrong. Yeah. And they're not open to reconsidering how they've been doing it? For the most part, they are not. Is that depressing? Yes, but I keep <laughs> on trying because it's the sort of thing where the, the, the objective is good enough and important enough that you have to keep on trying, which is 
I guess what I'm saying, I'm also a bit like Stockdale. I'm, I'm optimistic that, I'm, that we're going to get through eventually, and I've been trying this now for <laughs> 20 years. And I'm, I'm not always the most popular guy around the water cooler, but I don't mind. I, you know, if you believe the cause is worthwhile, you keep on pursuing it. What are robo-advisors? Robo-advisors are the things that have been around now for about eight or ten years. They've, they've been around for a bit longer, but they've been prominent for the past eight or ten years. And they are companies that will use artificial intelligence and they will use uh, exchange-traded funds usually as the investment vehicles. You, you do a questionnaire and they will then build portfolios that's, that's based on your scored risk profile and they will help you to do things without the use of a human advisor to get you from A to B. In which case, if they're not human, with human foibles, frailties, egos, can they give you better advice than a human can? That's an open question when it comes to uh, market performance because right now we've had, I, I think the real test for wh whether a robo-advisor can do a better job than a human is when markets turn south. And since ho ro robo-advisors came on board, the only time we've had a real downturn was for five weeks in 2020 when COVID hit, mm. which is too short to have a meaningful sample size. So the jury is out. We don't really know if robo-advisors will do as good a job or less, of, less good of a job or a better job of modifying behavior on behalf of their our clients because we don't have enough data because we haven't actually been able to test the, the hypothesis. Got it. Okay. In which case, if you have ad, uh, financial uh, investors who are interested in this book mm -hmm. and who are interested in the way you do things, but they have a financial advisor at the moment who they're not sure is aligned with you on this, mm -hmm. what do you recommend that they do? The first thing you should do is you should do a, a careful self-assessment. So regulators here in Ontario, we've just merged the two main self-regulatory organizations. They've decided that the way that you should look at suitability is, is through a lens of two main tests. Uh, is it, uh, do you have a, a suitable risk tolerance and do you have a suitable risk capacity? So when you, when you think about am I maybe being too optimistic and is my advisor being too optimistic in what he or she is recommending to me, you need to go back and say, okay, so what is my risk tolerance or my risk you know, um, capacity? Mm. And think about it in terms of, well, what could go wrong? Because a lot of people will say, this is my attitude, but they'll have their attitude based on the recent past. And the recent past has been not that bad, thank you very much. Mm. And as a result, they'll say, oh yeah, that, that's fine. I can handle things because what you've had to handle in the recent past hasn't been that bad. But if you, if you do a careful assessment and say, okay, how would I react if the market dropped 30%? What if it was 35 or 40%? Would I be able to handle it? And then you do the other question of, okay, well, what about my capacity? Even if I could handle it psychologically, what if it didn't come back for five years? What if it didn't come back for seven years and you're retired or nearly retired and you're starting to draw money from that? Even if you can handle it psychologically, you might not be able to have the capacity to withstand the drawdown. So those are the sorts of things that you need to think about and reflect upon to make sure your portfolio reflects your tolerance and your capacity now before anything really bad happens. As a general rule of thumb, do you find that financial advisors like their clients to take perhaps more risk than they ought to? I would go further than, than that. I would say most financial advisors actively encourage their clients to take a little more risk than they, than they otherwise might mm. because most people are probably a bit too conservative most of the time. And so all advisors are doing is they're behaviorally coaching them to say, you know, uh, you don't need a portfolio of 60-40. I think, Mr. Jones, you could actually handle a portfolio that's 70% stocks and 30% bonds. And if Mr. Jones says fine and the advisor can make the case, there's not really a great deal of difference. We're, you know, we're talking about a fraction of 1% in terms of the long-term rate of return. But if you can handle the, the, the risk that goes with that extra 10% equity exposure, that might shave two or three years off your retirement date. Hmm. That's significant. Yeah. Let's, let's finish up on this. I, I imagine there are some people watching this or listening to this right now who do not have a financial advisor, but mm -hmm. they still want to invest their money as wisely as possible. Speak to them. How do they avoid the bull shift? The way you have people, evidence shows that people are very poor at self-assessment. So they can recognize bias in other people better than they can recognize bias in themselves. Given that that's the case, the way that you test it is to sit down with your spouse or your buddy at work or whoever, and you ask one another questions about, so, uh, you know, am I... Am I really anchored on what happened last week? Am I following the news too much and making decisions based on knee-jerk things that are not really systemic and long-term or not? Mm. And then you start thinking about, well, if I am, what can I do about it? And again, it, what, what, it requires careful, meaningful 
purposeful self-assessment. And we're not good at assessing ourselves, so we have to get third parties in. I assess you, you assess me, and I'll, be, I'll do a better job of telling you where your blind spots are than you will, and you'll, you'll do a better job of telling me because we don't recognize them in ourselves. So you have to do the careful self-analysis, but do them with a friend. Interesting. John, you're a podcaster too. Yes, I am. What's so your podcast called? Wait for it. You're, you're never going to guess. It's called Bullshift. You're kidding. The podcast. So Bullshift, the podcast, has been out <laughs> on all, all various social media since uh, the beginning of the year. You enjoy it? I do, yeah. It's, it's great. And that's where you can talk about these things. So anybody watching the show tonight, they'll say, well, I, that's, that's fascinating. I'd love to do more. And, and maybe you'll read the book. I hope you read the book. But if a lot of people these days, they don't have the time to read a book, but they've got half an hour that they can kill while they're going for a walk on a Sunday afternoon or whatever, mm -hmm. they can just pull up Stitcher or iTunes or whatever. If they're sitting at home, they can pull up YouTube and watch Bullshift the podcast. I talk to a lot of people that are smart that offer their perspective on behavioral finance and especially about optimism bias. Good stuff. I'm going to try the title of the book one more time. Been pretty good so far. Bullshift, How Optimism Bias Threatens Your Finances. John J. Degoe has been our guest. Thanks, John. Good to see you again. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Monday, May 29th, 2023. Milestones such as graduations, marriages, and having children often mark the progress of our lives. Tomorrow, we'll learn how FOMO, fear of missing out on those events, can shape lives as well. Also, a quick note before we go, there's a new episode of The Thread. This time, they explore the fight over green space in this province. You can catch it on youtube.com slash thethreadwithnam or on TVO.org. And as always, you can preview everything they cover on their Instagram account. That's at TVO The Thread. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. <laughs>